why. I'm glad I checked. Oh, dear. I was going to do this in reverse. I guess it wouldn't have been a verse thing, but I was going to do, let's do 1 John then. The Jola 9 letters. Can you find them at the end of the, the, the um, after the letters of Paul, there are what are called the Catholic letters. Catholic, not with a capital C, meaning they belong to the Pope, but Catholic in its sense of universal. They're addressed to, to the church at large, okay? The universal church. There's no individual being addressed. It's addressing everybody, okay? And, um, and so those are the letters of James, Peter, Jude, and John, okay? These three letters share a common vocabulary and a common situation, though how they connect to each other if, and how they connect with the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation isn't clear. Scholars in the Middle Ages would just assume, because again, they didn't, they, 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 they thought it was very important that these writings had a connection to an apostle. They assumed they were all composed for the same John. And scholars today are a little more reticent. That is, John, the author of Revelation, I will call John the seer, S-E-E-R, the one who has visions. I, will not, I do not think that he is the apostle, okay? And I'm on a, I have a question mark on who the beloved disciple is. Was that John? Or was it a John? Because there are many Johns, you know, in the, old world, in the ancient world, early church. It could have been a John, but not be John the son of Zebedee. Anyway, um, what is the connection? Well, there are obvious connections between the letters and the gospel. Images of light and darkness. Talk about the old and new commandments. The, the urge to abide in Christ. The command to love one another within the community. Having hatred for the world. Christ as the one sent by God into the world out of love. Those are themes that you'll find in the letters as well as the gospel. So there's obviously some kind of connection. We tend to talk about a Jonine community. Community. That is, again, the, uh, an apostle. But we don't know his real name. Could have been John. Could have been Fred. Could have been Bridget. Uh, that there is an apostle who was their apostle. Who was an who was eyewitness of Jesus. But who, who, gave a, who gave a very different vision of him. So notice that neither the letters or the gospel use the name John themselves. Oh, yeah, 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 I know the title, but that's not the letter. Neither the gospel nor the letters use the word John themselves. And I, and I mentioned the similarities. There are also differences. Things attributed to God in the gospel are attributed to Jesus in the letters. God is light. God is life. God abides in believers. Uh, God is in the believer, overcomes the world. Th those things, that's how the gospel talks. But in the letters, it's Jesus who is the subject of all those sentences. Glory, which is used 39 times in the gospel, is absent in the letters. In the first letter of John, Jesus' death has atoning power, where in the gospel, there's only just a scant mention of that. In 1 John, Jesus is the advocate. In the gospel, who's the advocate? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, right? There are, there are many Old Testament quotes in the Gospel. There are none in the letters. Now, this kind of list doesn't really prove anything. It just says it could be the author wrote it later or different circumstances. But there, there are similarities and there are differences. The, le the author of the letters is called, calls himself the Elder. The Elder. 
and uh, doesn't call himself an apostle. And all we can surmise is that the elder is a member of this Johannine community. And the change in vocabulary and theme suggests that the letters were just written later, that they are not contemporaneous to the gospel. Why? Well, 1 John, while, while what we call the letter of John, it's really kind of a treatise or an essay. And what it does do is it, it, it talks about themes in the gospel, and it also talks about a division in the church. And so it seems to be a document that, it, that attempts to clarify how we should understand the, the message of the gospel. That is, I told you that, that scholars proposed that there was, in the end, there was a fragmenting of the church, okay? And that this body took John's, John's gospel and went off into the Gnostic, Gnostic communities. The earliest commentaries that we have of John are all written by Gnostics, okay? Not written by what we call the Orthodox. So John's gospel kind of became very popular among Gnosticism, in Gnosticism, where Matthew, Mark, and Luke were the main gospels in the great church. But then there was this, but then a body of the Johannine church was reconciled to the larger, the great church. And that's how the fourth gospel became one of the four for us, okay? Um, it, so the letter is kind of a clarification to make sure we don't read the Gospel of John the way the Gnostics read the Gospel of John. Let's look at the material that talks about the breakup. Look at chapter 2 of 1 John, beginning with verse 18. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might be plain that they all are not of us. So this, you see the reference to there was a group who were part of us, who pretended to be part of us, but they really weren't. And the proof of that is they left. And this is the only, it's in this letter and in the second letter, that the only time in the Bible that the word antichrist appears. Okay? It may be a shock to you, because you expect in Revelation. No. It's the word that the author uses about people who used to pray with them. Get that? They used to be part of the same church, and now they're not. And the author of 1 John calls them the Antichrist. They are opposed to the true Christ. Um, yeah, that, look at verse 22. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. He who confesses the Son has the Father also. Chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, underline that, is of God. Every spirit which does not confess Jesus in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist of which you heard that it was coming, and now it is in the world already. Second John, verse 7. Many deceivers have gone out into the world, men who will not acknowledge the coming of Jesus in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Verse 9. Anyone who goes ahead and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Verse 10. If, oh, that's good enough. That's good enough. Enough. So you get a sense there's a little tension there, huh? That tension is, is um, 
uh, an important, one of the keys to understand these letters. Who are the others? An emphasis on Jesus as a heavenly revealer is found in the gospel. You know, Jesus as the one who has come down and revealed himself to us. That's one view of Jesus. Versus an emphasis that Jesus really became flesh. Really took on our humanity. Again, I, I use the word docetism. The word docane is to seem. There was a belief among early some, early, some early Christians, and I, I lump them with Gnostics, that Jesus just uh, pretended to be human. He really wasn't flesh. He was just putting on a mask. That every word he says, before he says it, he knows what you're going to say, and he's just kind of pretending to die. He, didn't, he, he knew he was going to rise. He didn't really, he, he pretended to be in agony. Okay? That's what's at stake. Was Jesus, I mean, I can see the attraction of this. That particularly if you read John's Gospel, you get the sense that Jesus is totally God, always and always what he's doing, never suffers. But how do you read that against the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Um, so we have this emphasis on the first letter that what's important is that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. The flesh, sarks. A body like yours and mine. There's also a, a, a distinction between what we would call present and realized eschatology. In John's Gospel, I made the point last time, to meet Jesus is to be judged right there. You know, he says, how you, if, you, if you reject Jesus in this life, you're already condemned. Versus the, the logic of the church that says, we're going to be judged one day. Okay, one day we're going to be judged. No, in John's Gospel, judgment happens every day by how you accept or reject Jesus. And you'll see in 1 John more references to the idea of future judgment. Okay? And third, a new emphasis on love in the letter. Um, that love is really, it's, you know, it's kind of ironic that the, the letter of John is divided into two, two sanctions. One section is about the Antichrist, the Antichrist, the Antichrist. And the other is the importance of love, 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 love. I mean, do you get that? I mean, it's like, but again, they've been hurt. They've been divided. They've been fragmented. So they reject that view of Jesus that, that the believers, the so-called Antichrist believers, took with them out of the church. But they re-emphasize the need to go back to what we've always believed, what we always knew to be the case. If what I've laid out to you is true, these letters give us a valuable insight into the strengths and weaknesses of the Johannine community. That again, look at, what was that page number again? 28, or reading 28. Again, remember, Raymond Brown, this is just a hypothesis. This is not anything we know for a fact. But it takes into account, it takes into account the growth of the church and the division so that the author of the letter talks about people who used to be with us and now they're not and they're the Antichrist and they, and they take the gospel out to the Gnostics, okay? But th that, that, why did this happen? Why did it have to happen this way? Well, you can look at the gospel and you can see maybe some of the reasons why it happened this way. What does Matthew, Mark, and Luke have to deal with trouble that John's gospel didn't have? If you have a, a family fight, what did Matthew, Mark, and Luke have going for them that John didn't have? Jewish. Well, they're both Jewish to some, to some degree. <laughs> what do they have? What does Matthew's church, Mark's church, even Mark's church and Luke's church have. Is there not somebody maybe left in charge of it? Simon Peter? Remember that name? There's structure in the Synoptic Gospels. There's structure. There's the apostles. There's Simon. Simon is told that what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There is a human leader who can say strike three you're out 
But in the Jonine community, remember in John's gospel, is there a leader? Who's the leader? Jesus is the leader. And how do we hold on to Jesus? He is the vine. We are the branches. What if one branch says, I don't like your branch? What do the branches do? Well, I'm just going to rip myself off and go with somebody else. That's the problem. There's no structure in John's community. See, that's, and again, I can make the connection to modern day conservative Protestantism. There's no structure. That's why if you don't like your church, you just break off and begin a new one. Okay? Again, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that it's a consequence. The, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke churches have structures. Okay? And he dies. And then who, and exactly, no successor, no successor. Well, in a way, but again, they didn't have, you know, texting and, you know, they were, they did not even have connections, but in a way they weren't connected with each other. Correct. That's true. But would they have said, you're not Christian? I don't, I don't know that. We don't know that. But they're surely walking down the road that's going to lead to them. That's why they split. They felt their own understanding of the text was more important than what the great body of believers. That's why the passage we just read, test the spirits. Just because you get a wild, wild, crack off, weird idea of what the gospel means, doesn't mean that's what it means. Just because you hear angels, doesn't mean you're hearing angels. It might be the devil, okay? So you see, there's a, there's a kind of a, in the synoptics, a kind of more critical, you know, don't assume you know what you're doing. You need authority, you need the community, you need the body. Where in John, it's like, well, Jesus told me what to do today. To heck with the rest of you. Attitude. Now, you find that among people in the church and outside the church. But I, I think this is an interesting thing to ponder. The fragment in the church happens when there's not clear authority. Not clear leadership. You might have loved that love, love, love Jesus thing in the Gospel of John. But see where it can take us. Second, um, John's gospel has a very high Christology. Jesus is divine. He's a heavenly messenger. But that heavenly messenger thing tended to deny his humanity and, and didn't leave much room for humanity. Again, Jordan community, it's black and white. You're being judged right now. Well, is the world all black and white? Some people see it that way, <laughs> okay? But, but the synoptics have room for gray, as does Paul, as does the great church, okay? So, I, again, I, I don't want to ruin reading the letters, but this is what's in the background of it, huh? Now, let's do some reading. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we saw it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you that you may also have fellowship with us. So again, the author is saying what I'm talking about is the old stuff, what we have seen and heard and touched, okay? It's, it's, it's the message that was of old, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, but we walk in darkness, we lie and do not live according to the truth. Verse 8. If we say we have no sin, now evidently that's what he, the author's enemies are saying. We don't sin. We're beyond sin. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him, Jesus, a liar, and his word is not in us. See, Gnosticism said that what, made, what, what saved you 
is what Jesus taught. Not his, his cross was totally irrelevant. The cross had nothing to do with it. Your body, in Gnosticism, your body has nothing to do with it. Your body is just... Eh. So what you do in your body doesn't matter. It's the, it's the secret knowledge. It's, it's the inside dirt. That's what saves you. And the great church said, no, Christ's death on the cross is what saves me. Not just that he, just, not just his message. Huh? So that's what maybe is going on here. Um, in verse, uh, we, we, read the, we already read the part about the Antichrist, huh? In chapter 2, verses 18 and following. Verse 28 of chapter 2. Now little children abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. See, notice two things. Abide. That word was a lot in John's gospel. You see the common language. But when is he coming? In the future. Huh? When he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. The, the, the author of 1 John expects Jesus to return and judge us. There was none of that in the gospel. None of that. You are judged by Jesus when you are in his presence. Chapter 3 is lovely. Oh my God, it's so beautiful. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Again, the author does not pretend to know everything or to know Jesus completely. We are God's children, but there's something more coming. Something more ahead. Um, I just turned the sound system back on. Sorry, it was off. I changed the battery, didn't turn it back on. Um, verse 11, chapter 3. This is the message which you have heard from the beginning. Again, notice how many times the author reaches back to the beginning. What, because it's not this newfangled stuff that the Gnostics are into. Huh? that we should love one another. Okay, that's surely a link to John's gospel, but there's gonna be more to come. Verse 15, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. So again, it's not what he said, it's not that he said he loved me, it's that he, he gave his life Chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus in the flesh is not of God, but of the anti. Verse 5, they are of the world, therefore what they say is of the world, and the world listens to them. It seems that the author says that those who left the church have done very well for themselves. Maybe, maybe even the greater number of the church left. You know? That's why he makes this kind of snipe that, uh, that they've done well in the world. Um, then he goes on again the to talk about the true nature of love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And he who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Notice what comes first is God's initiative. God loves us first. We don't claw our way to God to get him to like us. He loved us first, and then we respond in love. Verse 17. In this is love 
perfected with us that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. But he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Verse 5 of chapter 5. Who is it that overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with water and the blood. Now, again, remember Jesus' baptism? God said, you are my son, my beloved. And Jesus could have stayed right there. Hey, okay, I'm just going to bask in this. I'm the beloved, I'm the beloved. Too bad about you. <laughs> but that's not why he was sent, remember? His final words are, it is finished. The plan that the Father had given the Son was to die on the cross. That's why the author talks about the testimony of the water and the blood. The cross. Gnosticism is all about the testimony of the water. Jesus loves you just the way you are, just stay as you are. No, no demands. No, it's the water and the blood. Chapter, no, 2 John. Now, what scholars think is that these letters, why would two little letters like 2 John, really two non-entities, because they, they don't have anything in them, really. Why would letters 2 John and 3 John survive? Maybe because they were a package. That, the, that, the, that John, 1 John is an essay about the split in the church, about the need to love, the need to hold on to what was from the beginning, not to talk, take on new ideas, not to go Gnostic on anybody. And then 2 John is the letter. So 1 John is in an envelope. And on the top of the envelope is another letter. It says, read me first. 2 John is the read me first. It's a letter of introduction. Okay? The elder to the elect lady and her children. Now you think, oh, what? Now it starts out as a lady, a single, sing, a single person, but by verse six, it's plural, you, 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 you. So elect lady is probably the church. Okay, the elder, the elder is the author. Now is the elder the beloved disciple? Uh, tradition says yes, but again, uh, I don't know. Is the elder? He's the author here of the letters. Is he also the author of the gospel? Is he at least the genius behind the gospel? Could be. I, um, so the elder greets the elect lady who I love in truth, not only I, but also all who know the truth because of the truth which abides in us. And there's a greeting. And then verse four, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children following the truth. Again, emphasis on truth suggests, again, that fragment, that division in the church is what's causing difficulty here. Then in verse 5, how he must love one another. Now I beg you, lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Okay, Verse 7. We read verse 7 before. There are many deceivers have gone out into the world, men who will not acknowledge the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. So in a sense, this is a summary of the, of, the law, of the letter, of the first letter. Huh? Verse 9 again. Anyone who goes ahead and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Verse 10. Anyone who comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into the house or give him any greeting. So, again, if you thought the early church was lovey-dovey, well, by the end of the day, you're going to see it wasn't all lovey-dovey. There was this fragment. And in this letter, the author is warning the recipient not to receive that other group, their other understanding, their, I will say, docetic, Gnostic understanding. Okay? 
even though he preaches love, shed no love for them. Then there's a third letter. Now, there are three characters in this letter, and you've got to figure out who they are. Gaius. Gaius is mentioned right at the beginning. He's the recipient of this letter. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Gaius is a leader of the church who has been cooperating with the author's mission. Then there's Demetrius. He appears in verse 12. It says, Demetrius has testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. I testify to him too, and you know my testimony is true. Have you ever been asked by a high school student going away to college to write a letter of introduction for them? This is a letter of introduction. First John, the author, I'm sorry, of this letter is saying, Demetrius, you don't know him, he's trustworthy. I, I give you my word, he is trustworthy. Okay? And then there is a third character, Diotrephes, verse 9, who is also a church leader, <laughs> but he has not been working with the author of this letter. In fact, he has refused entrance to the elders' missionaries. Let's read that part. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge my authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing prating against me with evil words and not content with that, he refuses himself to welcome the brethren and also stops those who want to welcome them and puts them out of the church. Okay, now go back to 2 John, verses 10. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into the house or give him any greeting. Could it be... <laughs> that Diotrephes is doing exactly what the author in the second letter has done. Missionaries have come to his church. We want to preach in your church. Well, what, what do you believe about Jesus? Like, well, and then said, no, you can't come and preach here. You see, the church is fragmenting, and you don't know who's on what side. You see? And the, the author of the letter the second letter tells people, don't let any, just anybody speak in your church because there are people who have this wacko idea. And my suspicion is, as a pastor myself, I associate with Diotrephes. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know who to listen to. So what does he do? He won't welcome anybody. You see how that works? I mean, he, he doesn't know, but the elder is upset. Because he won't welcome my missionary. Well, he probably won't welcome, welcome anybody else's missionaries, too. He doesn't know where the lines of authority are anymore. Now, again, I'm, I'm getting all over the page here. But this is what makes sense of why all three letters are, sur are surviving. Again, there's not a whole lot in this letter. Nobody wants us read at their wedding <laughs> or their funeral. I mean, it's, it's, it's the dirty, ugly, underside of the church. And we're living it all the time. Because we're not angels, huh? It gets very personal. It gets kind of that's that's what I would and again, this is not this is Ray Brown's, this is his hypothesis. And it makes great sense. Second letter and third letters are well, second letter is a summary of the first letter, which is meaning to steer people in their reading of the gospel. Because there's been this division in the church. And some of the Duran community has gone off on its own and has, become, has grown into what we call Gnosticism. And the other part is trying to steer itself back into unity with the great church, the church of Peter, the church of the evangelists Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where there is clear structure. Now, as Catholics, we don't always like the structure of the church, do we? You know, we hate it when our pastor makes decisions for us when the bishop writes letters, when the pope says something. That's the flip side of this. But if you don't have direction, if you don't have clarity, what you get is people calling names. 
You think, I think the opposite. Your mother sucks, you know, that sort of. <laughs> that's what you get when people do not respect authority. Well, the angel told me, the spirit told me. Oh, I read the Bible this way. Do you see? Again, I, it's, there are Christians who have gone that way. There are church communities who have very little structure. And they're prone, and they might be right for all I know, but they're prone to break up because there's nobody to say, there's no umpire, no referee, nobody to say out of bounds. Confusion reigns because there isn't clarity. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, uh, these first and second and third letters, they, to me, they look like a bunch of negotiation to try to bring the team together. And especially second and third. Um, that's, that's a possibility. You're more optimistic than I am. <laughs> I mean, I think ultimately, again, yes, the, uh, the elder wants to be heard, he has a vision. He thinks that his vision, and, and it was received from the church, so his vision is our vision. But he wasn't getting acceptance, and he was kind of upset. Thus, he writes the letter to Gaius to work around Diotrephes, <laughs> because Diotrephes won't let, won't let his missionaries in, so Gaius maybe will. <coughs> but ultimately, you're right. You're right. Other comments or questions? Yes, Peter. Do Paul's letters have any influence on the Julianite community, or is it conceptual? See, if you think, you know, again, I told you the tradition says that the beloved disciple and Mary spent time in Ephesus. Well, Paul spent, he claims to have spent three years in Ephesus. He wrote a letter to the Ephesians. Yeah. But there's no evidence of connection. No evidence of connection. He would have been earlier, but why, but why aren't there, where are the Pauline churches? You know, they're, they're not talking to each other, obviously. I mean, if they're, again, if indeed the memory, if the tradition that says the Juranine community is centered in Ephesus, and there's no evidence that they show that they, they knew Paul or cared about Paul, they are, as you said, they're silos. They're, they're not communicating with each other. They're two different kinds of Christian, I guess. I wouldn't say denomination, but they're, there are two different kinds of Christian. <coughs> Other? When they, when they, you said that eventually they joined. Some of them rejoined. That's, that's, that's Brown's thesis. That explains how did the fourth, the fourth gospel was not read by most of the church. I mean, it took a long time before the church of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Peter read the gospel of John. They, because it was like scary. And because the, because the Gnostics, as I said earlier, the Gnostics made hay with it. And Gnosticism, I mean, Google Gnosticism later today or tonight and see the battle of the early church. That was the church's great challenge, Gnosticism. First, persecution by the Romans, and then what to do with these other kinds of believers. I can take care of that for you. <laughs> Other questions or comments? <laughs> really, I can. <laughs> Who are the ones? It's it's a cat. It's addressed to a group. Well, it really is not actually. It's really what this one addressed to a, an individual, Gaius. How how come we're reading Gaius's mail? <laughs> so, somebody kept it. Who would have kept it? Well, I can only imagine it being kept if it was part of a bigger package. But again, then, but th this is how John's material becomes part of the, it, it, it didn't just go off into Gnosticism and be lost, it was brought into the church while a goodly number of the body went off into Gnosticism. Other comments or questions? Yes, sir. Not at all. Yeah. 
Very much so. Again, it's, it's personal mail. You know, the, First John's an essay. It's, it's for public reading. It's, it's, you know, it's, but this is just na a nasty gram. He's frustrated. The elder, whoever the elder is, is frustrated. Again, whether the elder is John or whether it's another John the elder in Ephesus. Again, my argument is the Bible isn't just a nice book of niceness. It's not, you know, Hallmark cards. This was a response to a real problem in the church. And it continued to be a problem. And so this, what it, the only reason they could accept John into the canon is to have this along with it. Because this tempers John, roots John. You know, there will be a judgment. Jesus is of the flesh. You know, loving your neighbor. I mean, you know, it's not just pie in the sky and, and test, the, I mean, test the spirits. All of that is pretty traditional, conservative church stuff. And, and, and John, the letter of John, pulls the gospel in with this language. And I think that's, I got Brown thinks, that's why. There were lots of other things that were written. Oh! Oh, that's for the next thing. I could have brought you a, a whole big, fat book of Gnostic Gospels. Gnostic Gospels. Some of them are commentaries on John. Huh? I mean, that's how much the Gnostics love John's Gospel. Is there uh, a Gospel of Pilate in there? Uh, there is a Gospel of Pilate, not in this book. You mentioned that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not, yeah. Well, I can get that during lunch if you want. But, yeah. That, that's not a, Pilate's Gospel is not a Gnostic Gospel. Well, <laughs> I kind of alluded to it earlier, I think. Um, Gnosticism, well, you, you find it on university campuses. You know, um, really educated people think that education is all that matters. And, and that history and, and other people doesn't, don't matter so much. And, and tradition doesn't matter. They, so in a sense, intellectuals tend to be Gnostic. Okay, in that sense, it's what you think that saves you, not what you do. Your personal life doesn't matter. It's what you think that matters. But as I said, in the church, think of people who, people who, have, who have visions all the time. You know? I mean, now again, there are, there are visionaries in the church who have been received in the church. You know, their visions have been acceptable. But there are lots of visionaries who haven't, whose visions have not been accepted because they run contrary. I mean, we just say this. There is public revelation and there is private revelation. The Bible, the creed, is public revelation. All believers are expected to hold it. It's addressed to all. Maybe Jesus comes to you tonight in your dreams and gives you something to love your wife better or tells you to go sell your car and ride a moped or whatever. <laughs> that, now, maybe Jesus wants you to do that. That's private revelation. It's addressed to you. It's for you. Now, you might get up and tell us all about it, and we might say, well, that's, that's nice. We'll do that too. But we don't, we're not obliged to. I find a lot of people today, maybe it's a little new agey, a little new agey stuff would be kind of would be Gnostic too. The idea that, well, Jesus told me to do this, or I feel, I feel I should do this. That my feelings matter more than the tradition, than the authorities. I get that a lot. <laughs> uh, not, not just in church. But I get that a lot. That's Gnostic. That, 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 the, that somehow the authority is speaking to me directly. And you don't get it because you're out of the picture. Oh, but TV is it's, that's when it could be an example of that. It's, it's a lot of things. I mean, and it's, it's not just, it's always, it's always been there. It's not just first century. It's not just 21st century. There's always been the, I don't like, the situation the way it is. I don't like the structures the way they are. Nobody listens to me. Well, I have my own inspiration. I mean, you see it all the time. When I don't win, we pick a vote and I lose. But I'm not okay with that. <laughs> okay? I mean, until I have my own inspiration. It's, 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 it's in us all. Time for lunch, eh? Time for lunch.
Pray. Pray for lunch. <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, good and gracious God, 